Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Northampton Planning Board meeting of March 14th, 2024. Um, we're here live in uh, City Council Chambers and also uh, Zoom. There aren't many participants or one participant out there. There will be more, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> George Tradition at our planning board meetings that we open up with an opportunity for public comment or any items that people would like to speak to that aren't on today's agenda. And today's agenda consists of a, an application by Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School, another application up on 87 Ryan Road, and an application on, is it 808? 808 Ryan Road. So is there anyone in the audience here at City Council Chambers who would like to speak to another matter? All right, hearing none, is there anyone um, on Zoom who would like to speak to any matter before the, yes. via chat, right? I don't, I don't see it, okay. Okay, um, so just before we start, you know, uh, another reminder to my compatriots on the planning board that we need to kind of project. We've had some issues with folks on Zoom being able to hear us and sometimes even in council chambers, especially when we start discussing the plan among ourselves. So remember that it's public record and being recorded. So we need to make sure that we're speaking out. And turning. And turning our microphones on when we're about to speak. Okay. Well, at this point, why don't we open up uh, at seven o'clock a site plan review application by Smith Boak and Agricultural High School for a 7,900 plus square foot new horticultural building at 80 Locust Street, Northampton, map ID 23B-47. And this is a site plan review, so a simple majority uh, is required of four to seven members to accept to pass this application. Um, I, is there a presentation? Hold, hold a second. I, I am on the, uh, uh, I'm not sure what you call it, uh, the uh, advisory. advisory board, I, but I don't feel like it. I feel like I could be impartial. Impartial? You don't have to decide. Um, you know, uh, it's not a paid position. It is not paid. One hundred. What's the year's chagrin? Paid. <laughs> um, I mean, we have more than we have enough. I think that. Um, I think that you open that up. You don't have a financial Zero. relationship, so I think that would be yep. um, fine. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Oh. Good evening, um, board. I just want to introduce myself uh, before I turn it over to my team. So I'm Andy Lincoln Hoker. I'm the superintendent over at Smith Vocational. And I just want to give you a, a, sort of a Cliff Notes version of why we're standing here this evening uh, as a reminder uh, to the board and, and also the community. We had a devastating fire back in May of 2022 uh, where we lost the majority of our existing horticulture building. And uh, from May of 22 to now, uh, the biggest struggle has been to uh, design a, ability, a building that then fits within a budget that we have. And that budget was basically non-existent. Uh, we've been working around the clock trying to find different uh, revenue sources, uh, different grants, uh, assistance from the state and other entities. And we are finally now at the point where we have the revenue uh, where, we can, uh, uh, where we can begin to move forward. Just one reminder, you know, as a vocational school, we have 15 programs. Uh, we have about 600 students on campus uh, coming from all over Western Mass. Uh, I, I, I typically tell people we have students from the New York border, the Vermont border, the Connecticut border. We even have students out uh, beyond Worcester. Uh, so, But this one particular program that we have, Horticulture, again, is only one of 15. And more specifically, uh, the building that we're looking at trying to rebuild, uh, one of the advantages of, of building new that you're going to hear from the experts this evening is that we can hopefully remain in the, the remaining aspect of the building that didn't uh, burn down from the fire. We can keep the students in there for the next year or so during construction, so they're not going to lose the instructional time as we build new. Uh, that was one of the big advantages compared to trying to renovate or rebuild within the existing uh, building that we have. 
where do we put the students? Uh, so what you're going to hear from this evening is actually a separate building uh, down that same complex, down the back side of the campus. You really can't see it from the, the, the main road. Uh, if you're familiar with the campus, uh, it's sort of next to the old, the, the former uh, Northampton Park and Rec building. Uh, we have an old set of tennis courts down back. It's sort of in that area of campus on the back side of the football field. Uh, that building is going to house most likely at any given time a maximum of 24 students. Uh, so we have 12 students maximum per grade. Uh, so for the four grades, but we have two grades in that particular building at any given time. So a relatively small building, uh, but again, it's a very important building for our students obviously service, serving a, a lot of communities in Western Mass. One highlight that we have, uh, I think we're very proud of, I think if you if you surveyed the students, one thing that they're really looking forward to with this building is an indoor climbing facility. Uh, if you ever drive by the campus uh, when the weather's nice out, you'll probably see a lot of students up in the trees, you know, learning uh, climbing techniques, uh, but that sort of stops in the wintertime. Uh, with this new building, the students are gonna have that opportunity uh, to practice those skills inside. So I just want to give you a quick overview. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity, uh, despite a, a horrific incident that happened a couple of years ago. I'm going to turn it over to my team to give you all the specifics and answer any questions that we may have. So thank you. Uh, if I need to share screen, I was going to pull up the slides. Um, so you just, um, it's like you're on Zoom, so you okay. can do share screen. Well, while I'm messing around with this, my name is Helen Fantini. I'm an architect, project manager with SMMA. Also happen to be the mother of a student in this program. So when this opportunity for this project came up, um, I absolutely had to be involved and we were lucky enough to win it. Um, and here, I think many of you know Rachel Leffler with Berkshire Design Group, um, our civil and landscape uh, team. And then actually, we also have Craig uh, Wilbur with Schoolhouse Construction, the OPM for the project. Um, so as mentioned, is that the building, we're not fully replacing Building E, otherwise known as the Horticultural Building, simply because we do not have enough funds. Um, the funds that we have um, pulled together to date, thanks to the efforts of everything that Andy and his team have done, um, will enable us to partially replace the building in the location shown on, um, on the screen. Um, so building E is off to the left, um, partially destroyed by the fire. Um, and then of course the new horticultural building quite efficiently um, designed as a rectangle. Uh, we hope to be able to add to it in the future because it will not fully replace building E. Um, as Andy mentioned, um, we do have at the center and once we get to some renderings, you'll see expressed uh, in the on the building with the building uh, volume is, is that climbing structure. Otherwise, this is a very straightforward wood frame building. Uh, it is all electric. We are well aware of the um, you know opt-in opt-in optimized opt-in stretch code opt-in opt specialized stretch code, which we will meet with this project. Um, and I think with that, maybe I'll let Rachel take over on the site plan. And if any uh, building questions uh, come up, happy to answer. Thanks. Um, You see the mouse, okay? Is the page down? There, okay. it's just a delay. Um, as Andy mentioned, the this is the Smith Vocational Campus, uh, which has a uh, frontage on Locust Street and Cooley Dickinson Hospital is in a butter to the east. Our project area is a little over an acre, 1.15 acres. Um, and it is taking place down slope of the, the athletic field um, and taking over, repurposing an old parking lot um, for the site. This is an image of um, where the a portion of building E used to stand and then what the part of the structure that's remaining over here. Um, again, this is another view of the project location with the campus. So the campus area is shown in the light green color. 
Um, the butters that were notified as part of this application are shown in a, a pinkish mm -hmm. color. Um, we are, you know, we're over 800 feet away from Mocus Ave in the front and another 100, 600 feet away from. Can you speak up? Yeah, sorry, I'm a low talker. Um, we're over 800 feet away from Locust Street and in the front, and we're around 600 feet away from Elm Street on the from the south side. Uh, the project is a URB zone, and there's an SC zone uh, that runs through the property, uh, and our project area is located within the URB zone. Uh, this is a survey prepared by Northeast Surveyors showing an area around the project area that we were working. So to orient you, a lot of our plans have the same view orientation. This is the athletic field. This is uh, building E. This is the parking lot. Um, animal science building is over here, which will remain active throughout construction. This is the horse barn, the motel, which is where animals are housed overnight, and then a hoop house. Um, there's an existing solar field over here and some parking spaces which will remain with the project. During construction, um, we will be installing a construction fence around the area of, of construction. Um, and we will be allowing access through this existing service drive throughout construction um, so that there can still be life safety access to the animal science building. Um, we are providing a, a fence around the property, as well as a tracking pad and gate and Knox box. Um, several trees will be removed as part of the project. The students, um, one of the great, one of the cool things about this project is the students are very much involved in both the design and the eventual construction. Um, they are going to be transplanting a, a over 40 inch caliper tulip tree on somewhere else on campus and they're helping with the, both the cutting of trees and then the eventual planting of trees on site. So it's great that they're part of this process. Um, during construction two, there's an area that we're designating as a sediment uh, receiving area during, if, in case there is a stormwater um, inundation of an open site, and we are providing erosion control barriers on the downslope sides of where we anticipate construction. Um, Pedestrian access and vehicular access are separated in this plan. We are providing a pedestrian pathway that's accessible, so less than 5%, no um, railings required um, to zigzag down the slope and provide access to the front entry of the of this, this new building. Um, that area too, that sloped area, we think in the future, the students could again design that experience as like an amphitheater or garden space. Um, but again, that'll be in the students' hands. Um, we will be planting over over 10 shade trees and over uh, over 12 understory trees. Again, the students will be selecting selecting the species and, and doing the planting on site. We'll be seeding with a drought tolerant tall fescue rather than a bluegrass blend to stabilize the site. And we have a um, New England what New England plants um, erosion control mix for the bioretention area. Vehicular access comes through the existing um, paved areas on campus or between building B and building E. Um, we've checked with, with the vehicle turning diagram to make sure that the fire truck can make it make it through the site. So um, we reviewed that with the fire department also, and that has been approved. So the fire trucks or any emergency um, vehicles could come through here. They can either come in, swing in here, and then loop back around. Um, or they could, or they could come down this way and, and loop in the other way. Um, this parking area is less than two percent, and it's a service area for many of the three equipment bays where agricultural equipment it will be maintained, and students will learn about um, servicing them. Grading wise, this is a plan showing just the amount of grading taking place. Um, so the site itself. Today, it's about 10 feet down from the agricultural field. We're actually going to raise the finished floor up about another two and a half feet just um, to make sure that we get positive drainage away and to provide accessibility uh, through this walkway um, and also make sure that we have safe uh, 
safe sloping areas for vehicles. Um, we are then intercepting stormwater that comes down off of that slope before it reaches the building. We're gathering it into uh, basins and diverting it into the bio, bio retention area and other area, level spreader down slope. Um, these are some of the details that were submitted in the plans. There was um, there was a little bit of back and forth with EPW with our stormwater permit. So the the plans here with the cross through are the one the old ones, um, and then these are the the new updated ones with that. Um, and so we have quite quite a few utilities on site. Um, we are connecting the sewer main that goes out to Locust Locust Street is. Um, is upslope of our area, so we will have a pump chamber. We'll have a thousand gallon tank um, with a grinder pump. Um, we're planning for a transformer, uh, sorry, a generator on site for backup power. Um, we have a, electrical connections here, and then we'll be tying into, um, into the existing water system, and we have a separate water path and sewer line. In the email that Carolyn forwarded, uh, we got some comments from from DPW and they they wanted a greater separation between the water and sewer line, which we can accommodate and a maintenance plan uh, for this uh, sewer system that's more proactive, which we can definitely help help generate for the project. Um, stormwater from from the roof is gathered and collected and directed into this bioretention area as well as runoff from this area. This meets the new Northampton stormwater standards um, for water quality as well as volume. These are some more details. Um, lighting also, um, we've made some updates to the lighting since the submission. Our previous submission uh, did not yet address the new 2700 Kelvin requirement. So we've uh, swapped out the fixture with a new one. Um, so this is the new, the new fixture. It's a Vega fixture. It comes in a 2700 Kelvin temperature. And then it's bug rating, it has, it does have a backlight rating of one, but its uplight is zero and its glare is zero. So it'll, and we think it'll perform really well. We did have, and this is the new updated photometric plan. Um, there are a couple hot spots where it's over three foot candles, which is the maximum required for this zone. Um, but our electrical engineer says that they can dim the lights to meet that requirement. So we are only having or keeping the lighting simple on this project and only having down lights at the entries and doors to the building. Okay. Can you say that last part again? <clears throat> to keep it simple, we are. We are only providing lighting on the building, down lights on the building, no pole mounted sight lights. And then rest I have are building plans. Do you want to talk to them? Um, so the, the building as conceived will consist of two classrooms plus a simulator classroom and that those simulators are something that the, the um, school was able to obtain through a grant. Um, so two classrooms um, and two shop spaces. One of the shop spaces is horticulture. Um, a flexible space with the ability to you know, build projects such as landscape projects, um, as well as an agri agricultural repair shop. If we had had more uh, funding, the um, the other two uh, spaces, three spaces that would be accommodated would be an additional classroom for growth, um, the head house and greenhouse. So right now those spaces will remain where they are in the existing to remain building E. Uh, roof plan, um, we're actually actively um, seeking um, a PPA provider to um, incorporate um, PV for the roof, but understand that it needs to be PV ready and um, this project will be. Uh, building elevations, um, and you'll see better um, renders um, as mentioned, the, the building is set quite far back on campus, um, but we do feel that the climbing structure may be a bit of a beacon. You'll be able to see it from, um, 
from the road or, or close to being able to see it from the road. So um, it is a wood clad building. One of the funding sources that came through very recently through departments of conservation resources and energy and environmental affairs um, uh, have been to um, urge us to showcase wood, especially locally grown woods. So this will be a wood, wood clad building. Um, jury is still out a little bit as to the finish on it, whether we will allow it to weather to gray or to paint it. Um, and again, you'll see in a render that it's, um, right now it's conceived of a, a red, uh, kind of agrarian, uh, look, um, but we are evaluating all, all options. And as mentioned, uh, the render, a little small, um, that climbing structure that um, peeks through, um, pierces the volumes, the bifurcated volumes of, of this very simple building. And the render below is, is the view from, you know, um, pretty far back, um, closer to the road and across the athletic field. I think we're back to the site plan. And we're back to Zoom. <laughs> so any questions for us? <clears throat> No. Us too. Um, currently on the site, there's about five major trees. Mm -hmm. um, and are they all coming down? Mm -hmm. They're not in the footprint of the building. Um, okay. And it looked like from the site illustration that they're all let out. Yes. Um, they're all coming down. Mm -hmm. Back there's mm -hmm. one that's being. <laughs> Um, yes, there. There's one that's being air um, spayed, air spaded, um, and being transplanted on site, and the others are are coming down. So I, I struggle a little bit why they're all coming down. Um, thank you, Gina. I struggle a little bit why they're all coming down. They don't seem to be in the construction area, other than it, it, there's a. I'm certain there's a lot of trenching for the drainage work and everything and sure yeah i can do that there's one especially nice i'm not sure if it's a tamarack or uh the meta sequoia uh yeah yeah that's coming down too and and, and yeah and, and i guess i'm puzzled because i'm sure smith folk because your arborist history and all, and yeah, so the the meta sequoia, which is beautiful, yeah, it's a dinosaur tree. It's one of it's one of my personally favorite trees. Um, it's right here on site. Uh, the the cottonwood, the large cottonwood, as you're coming down into the site, is actually in poor health and needs to be removed. It, mm -hmm. yep. It's not faring well. Um, as well as we've heard that the catalpa and the and the little leaf linden are not doing so well. Um, some of these, the elm and pear trees along here are being transplanted by the students. Um, was the meta sequoia also being transplanted? You know? Yeah, oh, sorry. There was some early discussion about moving that one. As you can see the grade here, was there a way to move this tree on top of this little elevation here? But the jury is still out. We weren't quite sure if that's, that was even possible or not. So, and be and and what is uh, it's impacted by? I'm not sure what that that dark gray area is. Right. So, um, I'm going to flip to the next slide to to hopefully walk you through it. the The dark gray area is our tracking plaid, and that could be placed elsewhere on site. That's not why the tree's coming down. Um, in the next slide, our grading plan. Um, let's see if you can see that. So here is the meta sequoias in the footprint of this, of the service, service pad area. The, which is another way of saying a parking area. Yeah. Service pad area. Yeah. It's a, it's a vehicular access way. So there are, um, three vehicle bays, like garage bays right. for cars. And mm -hmm. so this is an area where students are going to be driving in, backing up, driving in, backing up heavy equipment 
that then gets serviced by the building. Um, okay, yeah, I, I yeah. doubt that's Sequoia. It's too, I'm not, I'm an amateur, but I doubt it could be transplanted and moved and survive. We could, um, we could ask if the students could plant another. Okay. I, I guess due diligence was done to look at it. It's uh, it's unfortunate. A, a lot of a lot of the site area that we're touching is either footprint of building, footprint of the surface area for the heavy equipment, or regrading for the um, bioretention area to balance the stormwater. Um, the old. Uh... I'm not sure what you call it, the building that was the old uh, recreation building, recreation department. I saw quite a few students accessing it uh, today. And how will they access it in the future? The animal science building? Yeah. Yes. It's that one is, yeah. Service drive. And right, so is your question after construction? After construction, right. So after construction, the, the students in the animal science building, the former park and rec building, uh, that's where we have our, our, what we call related classrooms for animal science. Uh, so when they're actually learning concepts around animal care, before they move into the barn, uh, they're in that animal science building. They're gonna access the rest of the campus through the service yard that we were just discussing is one option, and then they can go up the walkway. Uh, they have honestly, uh, they have sort of created their own path currently. Uh, they walk right across the football field. Uh, to access the rest of the building. So the football field is all in here. So they, they simply walk out of the animal science building, they take a left and they're on the football field. They, they just walk across the field, to be honest. Oh, I thought it was so they have multi-access points. They can either do the football field or technically they should be using the, the, uh, the service yard there, which beyond the parking lot, I just want to reinforce that service yard for the horticulture students uh, is sort of outdoor learning space. Uh, that's where they're going to learn a lot of hardscaping activities, uh, you know, brickwork and so on and so forth, along with uh, driving skills, you know, learning how to drive some of the smaller tractors. We need to have ample space for them, as you can imagine, as a student driver. So it's not simply a parking lot. Um, and then the third access point, uh, as Rachel was talking about, this currently is a sort of a a rough service uh, road currently, and it goes down to the orchard. Uh, that goes up to the uh, the barns that we have, uh, the MS barn or whatnot. So again, if, I've, if I'm an animal science student, I'm in that animal science building uh, and related, I then move to the barn, I'd be either going through the uh, the service yard or that, that dirt access road. So they'll still be connected to the campus. Thank you. There's a funny little shed what he said that says radioactive, just out of curiosity, what is that? And is it coming down? On the existing conditions plan? I'm not sure. It's down by the Sequoia. It's a metal bill. It's a metal building. And it just strikes me as being odd in a school grounds. It says. Probably needs DEP approval, it right? Probably needs something be I think what you're referring to are uh, these storage containers in this area right here, uh, which is just off of this used to be the barn that burnt down. Now it's a concrete slab that you if you drove back there. So if it says radioactive, I think that would be the student's joke to keep people out. Uh, to be honest, it's it's fuel storage. That, that's where we maintain um, gasoline and whatnot for the vehicles, the, the tractors. Okay. We'll open it up to comments from the audience, unless any board member has other questions. Okay, at this time, we'll open up the application for public comment. Is there anyone here at City Council Chambers who'd like to speak to the plan? Either for and against. All right, and then we'll turn to the Zoom room. Carolyn, any chats? Yes. All right. Um, Carolyn raised a couple of conditions in her report about the, the lighting plan. Um, I think they address the light, um, but my recommendation would still be to have um, as built to make sure that the 
the right lamp gets picked off the shelf by the contractor and installed. Were there any other uh, comments from DPW? Um, they DPW would like to, um, similar to typical conditions, um, that the applicant shall submit revised final construction plan signed by PE at least 15 days prior to applying for a building permit. Um, and then um, those plans should also show, provide the updated lighting um, that they've just presented tonight. Um, they also, the condition about um, just an, uh, um, the water mains being separated um, at least 10 feet horizontally from the sanitary line. That isn't a condition we would put on it though, right? Um, you know, it's sort of, it's one of those ones that you could in that it's site plan, that they're gonna have to meet that requirement when they go to DPW right. anyway. So for the utility plan, so it, you know, it's up to you. And uh, the applicant did the calculations around the, the amount of trees they're removing and came up with 54 inches as a replacement value. Right. And that's been all specced out in their planting plan. Um, Okey doke. Um, if there are no other Questions for the applicant or no comment for the move. We close the public hearing. A second. Motion has been made and seconded to close the public hearing. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor, close in the public hearing. Thank you. So uh, again, we have uh, we don't need a condition on the lighting because they've already provided that. But we have a condition. Do we have a condition that they? Um, provide the planning office with stamp plans? Um, I would recommend that um, upon, prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy that they submit stamped as built for the lighting to ensure that it complies with the revised plans that they'll submit before the building permit. All right. And do they need to show a planting plan at the 54 inches yes. also? So that's a second condition. Yep. Um, and then they need to provide a... a um, a stormwater management plan with the DPW or filed. Right. A uh, maintenance plan maintenance for stormwater. Plan. Yep. Okay. So three conditions. It sounded like there's also a maintenance plan for the uh, sewer ejection pump, possibly. They're, they're right. They get a CMO unless they do that stuff. Yeah. So that would be a DPW okay. requirement. Yep. Ask, are we going to want to review that? <laughs> No, but we're not reviewing any of this stuff that we're talking so about. So DPW's got it. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So those three previous conditions then. I move to approve the site plan at 80 Locust Street for Smith Smithvoke with the lighting, planting, and stormwater conditions previously described. Great. Second. Motions are made and seconded. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor of accept of the motion. Unanimous. Good luck with your project. Thank you. As as Northampton taxpayers, don't we all have a financial connection to this institution? Isn't it a city school? But you don't have a unique one that's different from that's the true. other. That's tactics. a good point. Thank you for the clarification. Is your mic still not working? Yeah, I think the mic might be broken. I don't know. I'm just using uh, Stacy's instead. Drop the mic. It'll be good. It'll keep me from making too many comments. I'll try it. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to move on to our second application of the evening. Oh, 
Okay, that's advertised for 7.30, a site plan review by Jamie Callen for detached second dwelling at 87 Ryan Road, Florence map ID 22D-7. And we need a simple majority of four of the seven members for uh, because it's a site plan review. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> this will be a little more casual, at least in our presentation material. Um, yeah. Make sure my phone is up right. I, I, Do you see screen share at the bottom? Oh, you have to go back to Zoom, that's why. Uh oh. And then screen share, and then you're going to, I think, the yes. that one. Thank you. Okay. Mm. There. <laughs> okay. So I'm here with the owners, Barbara and John. This is, and what they'd like to do is uh, build a small, uh, ADU in the back of their lot. So it's a single family residence right now. Um, <clears throat> there's a driveway and parking will, there will be no changes to the driveway there. There's a curb cut and there's, um, uh, at most there'd be one additional car to serve this, but no, no other significant parking changes there. So, uh, this is from the city site approximately where they'd like to locate it um and so we're just we're not trying to do anything you know we're trying to follow all of the standard setbacks so it would be 15 feet this shows it a little better from their actual survey plan but uh 15 feet from this side lot here and this is an existing um, garage slash studio, and, and the new dwelling would be uh, probably about 10 feet back from that. Um, and there'd be there's no planned changes or disturbances to trees or shrubbery or else. Um, the, <clears throat> if we can make it work, the utilities would be serviced through the main house here and through the existing driveway in the yard. So we'd be trenching here and actually going under the existing building to get back to here. And the idea is a simple, um, still under design, but just a simple shed roof construction, construction a 16 by 20 uh, footprint of it. Um, this is the existing shed or garage, and it's planned to go behind there. So this is just a concept of kind of how it would be placed. <clears throat> and these are conceptual drawings of what it would look like. Um, and of course the building, it will be all electric and follow all of the uh, stretch energy code requirements. That's it. Pretty simple. Simple and straightforward. So like the building inspector is gonna, I mean, the, the building code stuff that's gonna come up with that, like submitted that, you're gonna get a lot of comments. Yeah. Uh, do you just, you're just going to check it and make sure it doesn't change enough that we would need to re-review it, I guess, after that process? Right. So if the site, so if there are modifications, um, that are significant to the site that, um, that are required, there may be an amendment. Sometimes it's an administrative change. Sometimes it, it just comes to you, uh, on an agenda, or if it's a significant change, then it's a um, considered an amendment, it has to come for formal um, okay. public hearing again. 
right? But um, typically, you know, if if the orientation changes, um, but it's still generally in the same footprint, I wouldn't consider that a change that needs review. Yeah. And you're going to use the existing parking space for a second car, whatever vehicles are, and you'll deal with that as you need to all in this side of that chain fence that you have there. Yeah. Going beyond there. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Or certainly waiving any traffic study. Right. Building of this size. Does there need to be space for an extra car? Or are there already space for three cars? There's already cars space in there, really. And, um, you know, there, and obviously, I guess you need to plan for anything, but the it's the it's not necessarily a, a an additional residence. You know, it's a it's a guest place or an extra studio for them to use, or um, you know, or potential rental. But it but it wouldn't there wouldn't need to be extra parking. There's already ample parking in there. Right. The only one inconvenienced is the homeowner. Right. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Right. right. Can you can you describe the lighting plant exterior lighting? Oh, yeah. I can't believe. Yeah. So, I mean, it would all, we don't have a specific spot, but there, there would be at least a few exterior lights, you know, for safety and, um, and any of that certainly can be low profile and low temperature. I think it's, is it 2,700 oven is the limit? Yeah. So that's, that is no problem there's not going to be any new spotlights or or parking lot spotlights or anything like that um do we need to see that on the plan at some point just the lighting yeah that it's on the um building yep um no if it's on the building no as long as it's meeting the lighting and if standard. And after construction if there's pole lighting or anything of that nature then it's uh, an issue for the building inspector well if there is a new um it yes again it sort of could be determined at that time i mean if it's um a bollard lighting for a extra visual you know um support yep to the building, as long as it meets all the lighting standards, it probably wouldn't come back. But if there are multiple site, you know, site lights that are installed, it might require an amendment. Yeah. But there's no intention of this is a low profile. It's a, it's a small cabin in the back of the house. And you might've heard that the city would like uh, you to protect that big tree that's there. There's kind of an approved way of putting uh, protection around a tree during construction. Mm -hmm. And you're aware of that? Yep. Okay. Do we need to condition that in some way because it wasn't brought forth? Uh, I would recommend a, I would recommend a condition for um, prior to any site work that the tree protection be installed for that tree uh, in that location. Yep. Okay, if there are no other questions, we'll open it up to the public again. Is there anyone here in City Council Chambers who'd like to speak to this application? Any comments from our friends in Zoom? Any chat? I don't see any chat. I don't see any on my end. Do you see any on yours? All right. Uh, any other questions for the applicant before we close the public hearing? You know, is there a motion to close the public hearing? Who's close the public hearing? Second. Thank you, Sam. Motions are made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? All right. Unanimous. Um, So if I understand correctly, there's just one condition about the tree protection at this point. I move for the project on Ryan Road uh, with the condition that the uh, tree is protected. Thank you. Is there a second? 
Second. All right, motion has been made and seconded to approve the application. Um, any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Well, thanks for coming. Thank Good you. Good luck with your project. Thank you. Can I just pull this out or do I need to uh, pull it up? All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. Good drawings. Keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually covering almost the entire length of Ryan Road with these two projects. We've got both ends. <laughs> yeah. Oh, big stuff happening. <laughs> this will be my biggest challenge to see if I can get this to work. And already I'm in trouble because. Uh -oh. <laughs> No, you have a um, we're going to have to stop this screen share okay. so that you can restart. Okay. Thanks. So and thanks for all the help. Oh, sure. Okay. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you in person. Silly. Nathan's great. Your assistant. Oh, good. Okay. So then you would just. Um, so you'd probably want to just hit that. Open this. Whoops. Well, it isn't. It's there's a size requirement, isn't there? Oh, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Judge. Go back to the. Like with that twenty, uh, ten by twelve or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Like they don't even know if it. Sure. Hey, excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's just like a studio. I don't even think they need to come to the planning board at all. Yeah. It's just a building project. And they may be using it as a rental. Already at this point, right. um, yeah. if we'll if open like up a, a if it's like a really application real unit, right? for site plan review by David Soin at 808 Ryan Road to construct a second attached dwelling and a special permit. For a second curb cut at 808 Ryan Road. Lawrence map ID 35-156. Um, so it's a, a, a special permit and a site plan review. Carolyn, help me with this. So it's two votes or we roll them into one. Um, so it you it depends. You can have you can roll it into one. Um you would probably, if you were going to separate them, you'd probably vote on the second curb cup, which is the special permit component, and then vote on the site plan if you were going to separate them. And so one needs um, five and the other needs four votes. Yeah. If we say uh, after listening to your presentation that we would say yes, but we're not going to allow the curb cut, are you going to move forward? I'd like to. Okay. All right. I'd like to move forward. I had that in part of the presentation. Okay. Alternative to the curb cut. Okay. We, can, we can chat about that a little bit. Yes. We, because as a general rule, they don't allow it. Right. I, that, we had discussed that, and I saw that in a couple of the... Uh, yeah. Articles three fifty. Yeah. In fact, the only way that it will happen is if by if you had some sort of what we've done in the past is a medical some sort of medical thing, and then the moment that house is sold as part of the agreement, they get rid of the curb cut. So I'm just trying to yeah. save yeah. Well, no, time. No, I, I, I expected that when I came okay. here, and uh, all right, I, then I, let's go for it. That so, yeah, that was part of the. Uh, You'll see in one of the slides we talk about that. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, David Schoen, my wife, Denise, as you said, we're proposing on building another dwelling in 808 Ryan Road. As you can see that on the picture, the very front, that's the existing dwelling. It's 490 square feet. It was actually your daughter's house. She moved. We downsizing, <laughs> literally. And so we had an opportunity to get this property and then, um, you know, potentially build another dwelling behind it. And then possibly rent this one out. Oh. Sorry, Mr. Sorry, this is 490 square feet? It is. It is. And Gotta love that Ryan Road Day Road. <laughs> <laughs> it was built in 1952. I suppose it was pretty good at that time. 
But, um, you know, if we were going to remodel that house, all the energy codes that would kick in would, uh, you know, basically take the house down. So we felt it would probably be the best to build another house, and then we could possibly rent that. For, you know, Northampton is always looking for additional houses. A great spot to rent a house in that area or a small, small place. So that, that was our plan with that. So this is a, the city map. You can see where it abuts Ryan Road on the front of the dwelling and the proposed back would be Bird's Pit would be the second curb cut. And that's what we thought maybe we could get permission for a second curb cut um, because it's kind of a unique situation where we do abut two roads and a lot of accessory type buildings or additions don't have that option. So that's, that's why we thought we'd bring that bring that up if, if possible. Did you split the property? No, I don't have enough frontage. I checked that with the building inspector already, and we talked about that earlier in the game. So, um, so then we came this route. To see how to see how this would work out. So that's that's a surveyor's plot plan, and up on the um, upper right, left, and the bottom right and left are the boundary pins. We had it surveyed, um, so you know we clearly know where the boundary lines are for this project. So we're not encroaching on any neighbors. So the scope of the work obviously is to uh, the existing dwelling will remain for future uh, rental unit. And then we have to clear existing trees, which we'll discuss with an arborist report that we have. Construct a new two-story single family, approximately 1,500 square feet in a detached two-car garage, uh, potentially a new driveway um, with a second curb cut. Next to are just a couple of uh, pictures of approximately what we're going to build. We'll have architectural drawings for building permit if, if we do get approved as we move forward. But that's basically just a, uh, you know, since it's a narrow lot, we would go up a second floor for an additional bedroom on the second floor. So it would be two bedrooms and two baths. So that would be the front. Obviously, we'll have no chimney. The house will meet the current energy codes. Um, I am an electrician and have a construction supervisor's license. So I'm familiar with all the new codes that have been adopted in Northampton. And, um, you know, we'll try to get it as close as net zero as possible. We'll have any um, heat source, um, a heat pump for the uh, ducted system, not ductless, but we'll put a ductless, a ducted system in, um, hybrid hot water heater, spray foam insulation, and we'll follow all the, you know, appropriate codes for that. That's the back view. The back view, instead of that, that um, roof line coming out like it does, like a chalet, so to speak, we'll have a, a shed dormer on the back just to overhang the porch area, as well as solar. That's, um, as we'll talk about with the possibly removing of some trees, we want to open up for solar, we'll try to get the maximum of solar as possible uh, on the east-west direction of the house. And, um, you know, so we're going to definitely put that in. And it also is in a, on a water protection area, WSP area. So we need to keep 60% of open space. So with the existing dwelling single family house and the driveway and the proposed uh, new building and driveway, actually, okay, there's up on the screen. I can read it up there. I don't have it on my uh, thing here. So at any rate, it comes up to 4,492 square feet and the lot size is 20,687 square feet. Where the buildings comes up to 4,492 gives us 16,000 remaining in uh, open space. And what's required is 12,000. So we have a little wiggle room, about 4,000 square feet of extra open space. And that's important. Again, with the if we can't do the second driveway, we'd have to have a, a, a larger driveway off of Ryan Road be, between the two dwellings. And that would take up, obviously, a little more space and two narrow driveways on the Bird's Pit side road and the Ryan Road side. Uh, that's another reason we'd like to try to get that second curb cut if possible, where this is a WSP area, and as well as additional uh, trees where we have to take down a great spot to add some extra trees. So we can chat about that as we move along. So that's the, uh, it's really not the greatest drawing, but anyways, that that's the proposed plot. On the bottom is the existing dwelling with the driveway. And on the, uh, obviously, straight behind it would be the new house. 
we have to keep 30 feet off, uh, 20 feet off of the road edge. And obviously we have an angle at that bird's pit side. So we came off the right-hand side. If you look at it, boundary pin, I came back 30 feet to give us an extra 10 feet of, uh, of um, wiggle room. And then we're 15 feet off of the neighbor on the, on the right-hand side, if you look at it, to the right edge of the, um, the house. And on the left side, it's 15 feet to the driveway because as you follow back, the garage would line up with that 15 feet approximately. Uh, and we have enough distance between the existing dwelling has to be at least 10 feet. We're well over that. We're 60 feet to the garage and about 90 feet to the uh, new dwelling. So I, I do, I did have a arborist look over the property. I did get a text uh, email from Carolyn this week to try to revise it a little bit more detailed. And unfortunately he didn't get a chance to revise it a bit. I do have a, um, a potential plan for additional trees. Um, the tree warden did come out today and look at the property and um, he wanted to move the potential curb cut to the opposite side, there's less trees. One thing he looked at, he looked at the neighbor's property. He didn't look at our property. So I do have pictures. And if Carolyn, if you saw that photograph, that open area, that's actually the neighbor's. And he uses that just, to, you know, drive all back and drop wood off. Yep. Whatever he does, I don't know what he does. And part of it comes over a little corner of my property. But at any rate, that's what I think he was looking at. And in that email, he uh, indicated it's 49 feet. And that's the neighbor on the original uh, my original surveyor's plan, if you looked at that, his property, you could see at 49, and mine is, I think, 95 feet on the front edge. So I think he, we have to revisit that probably on that, if it even is allowed to get a second curb cut. If it if it's not allowed, then, you know, obviously it's not a discussion. Because your intention now is to basically clear cut the lot. Well, as we go along here, let me, let me show you some of the uh, photos from the, Arborist of uh, selective removing of the hazardous of trees because a lot of these trees are in really bad shape. And um, so this tree here actually is not on the on the in the footprint of the building, but he did take note that it's between the two properties and it's um, structurally defective, has multiple trunks. And you know, so he did a pretty good job, I thought, at looking at the the trees, not to take them down, but to you know try to save them, but recognizing that some of these are second growth trees and they started out of seedlings and, you know, they started two trees into one, you know, it goes in, in second growth. And at this point in time, with the size of some of these trees, they're, they're dangerous. And we had one of the large white uh, pines at the top of it broke off last year. And luckily it fell into the wooded area. And, you know, we have young children next door and you, you know, hear these stories every year as the tree falls on somebody and kills them. So, you know, not that I don't play the significance of uh, removing them, but it is a it is a bit of an issue. There are um, three large oaks on the property that aren't mentioned in the arborist report at all. Um, he mentions the 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 maple, yeah. um, the these four trees, but there's three large oaks that I imagine you're taking down too. And well, a couple of those are up on the front. I have to talk to Tree Warden about those, and they're really right in that buffer zone of the, the you know. I need, need his permission, and a couple of the oaks are right there. I'd like to leave them. The only problem with that, again, I want to try to get the maximum of the solar. So it's a you know. Yeah. Do we get the solar or do we keep some of the larger trees? Some of the larger oaks, even, they're starting to lean out towards the road to get the sunlight. And I'll say that some of them are starting to move out to try to get more sunlight. So it's, um, I don't think that back lot was ever designed to have a nice trees. They were just second growth trees over the years uh, that were that were grown there. And um, incidentally, I grew up right down the street from there as a kid. You know, I remember the trees and so now they're showing my age, I guess, but they um, they were never really maintained and taken care of for uh, a nice hardwood lot, sort of speak. So, um, like I say, we have several pictures of the, the white pines and the, um, but this one here, if you see it, the one right behind it uh, broke, the top broke off of it last year in a windstorm. And uh, this one here, you can see woodpeckers and insects have, have uh, caused a lot of problems to that tree. And uh, so anyways, and there's there's another tree and it's quite large with the two two 
spurs coming off and they're, they're getting so large, they're going to eventually split right down and um, obviously would cause some serious problems. So as he indicated, 75, well, 75 to 80% of the trees on the property are either dead or diseased, structurally compromised, or in poor health. Some are leaning towards uh, the house and neighboring properties. He recommends that all the trees that fall within the footprint uh, be removed, identified as high risk. And uh, right here we have a, this is a, what we would kind of propose for a replanting, some probably red maples, some dogwoods or cherry trees and shrubs. Um, again, that would be up in the front of the existing dwelling. We have plenty of space there to add a couple of trees and in the back of the property. So in the back of the driveway, I didn't indicate um, a couple more trees would be behind the property. Already there's a small maple just on the right-hand side of the existing driveway, um, kind of on the neighbor's property line. And that's a nice tree and we'll keep that tree, obviously. And uh, we did start planting some aprovites along the property line near the driveway. Those would remain. And, um, you know, we, we definitely put new shrubs and plantings. We, we enjoy that. And I like the privacy, some aprovites probably along the neighbor's property line on the, on the right-hand side where it's open. The left-hand side, they have a stockade fence. So that, that's nice privacy. Mm -hmm. um, that pretty much sizes up what we need to do. Um, like I say, I know we had some discussions about the trees. The tree warden, I did um, have it on my notes to call him after we move along in this process. Um, but he did go out there today. Carolyn, I think, uh, notified him that to go out there. The, the, the tree warden. <laughs> so I, and I'm glad he went out. I mean, he, at least he's familiar with it. When I call him, he'll have an understanding of what we need to do. And he's looked at the property, which I think is really good. So the tree warden's jurisdiction is in the public right of way. So he wanted to make sure that um, where you were proposing the driveway to understand if there were any public shade trees, which have a completely different review process from the planning board. And so um, that's where he identified the 49 foot width of the right of way across from one side to the other and noted that where you were proposing the driveway access point did include public shade trees. So okay. even if the planning board approved a second curb cut on this side, mm -hmm. you'd still need to go through that public hearing process for the tree removal in the public right of way. I, I can flip the house too. We're not so, so the house, if they were to get a second curb cut, we could flip the house, no problem, and um, then have the uh, driveway on, on that opposite side. Yep. Let me just roll up here. I had a slide here about the... And then would you need to move the garage also yeah. in order to access the garage? Yeah, this slide here, I did. I kind of skipped over. So in that red, you could see where the, you know, the garage could potentially stay there, but it, it might have to be moved to the, uh, I guess that would be the east, over to the right as you look at the drawing. It'd be moved to the right, and then the one driveway off of Ryan Road would want to get four spaces in there. And I, I can't, I don't, I don't, yeah, two for each building, obviously. If we didn't do the curb cut. Yeah, if we don't get the curb cut, this would be the alternative right. plan that we thought about that we would have to, and you know, for aesthetics, I, I understand the second curb cut, but for aesthetics, I mean, this it, would be a large paved area right there where it's a nice open area now. You plant the garden and so much can be done right there. And unfortunately, I'd have, that's the only option I would, I think I could have for an alternative to a second curb cut uh, to put the driveway and the garage in that area. And it would take up, and it would reduce a little bit on the open space. We would still conform to open space but it would, it would cut into that area a little bit more. Um, Are there any driveways on the... the... The great part about that in the back, if you look at the, the, the right-hand side, no, that goes all the way to Ryan Road. And there's a... Um, they actually just built the mother-in-law apartment in the front of that house uh, about a year and a half ago. No, I'm talking about, like, are there roads right now? Are there eggs or... No. No. Are there additional residents with driveways close by? Just his neighbor has a gorilla driveway there, kind of a 
a farm driveway, but that's the only one. Yeah. Something his grandfather, he said, did years ago, I guess. But yeah, you know. No, and uh, so to the right of me, the houses all go through Ryan Road, and that property goes out to the corner of Ryan Road, Bird's Pit, that fork. And the people to the left, they just have that small parcel of property. And like you said, he uses it for dropping things off at his house, and I see him waxing his truck, and he drives through that way and whatnot. And mm -hmm. when I... Yeah, the next house over, which is, you know, probably 70, 80 feet away, which is a third parcel of property to the left, they obviously have a driveway at that point. So, and the other thing is to Ryan Road is much busier of a street. And when my daughter lives there, you know, over there to, and, and coming out of that driveway, boy, it can be tough because Ryan Road school trade th down there and the way they come around the corner, it, it can be dangerous at times because people do speed along pretty fast through there. So I, I, again, thought maybe on the back, uh, it's not quite as busy of a street. We nope. wouldn't be, um, and we talked about a traffic mitigation study even on that. And, um, you know, I, I understand that. So. No, and the sight lines are very good, as we say, along Birch Pit Road there. There's no curves. There's no hidden driveways. There's no yeah. hills. So right. it, it is, a, I think, a safer area to come out on. To uh... and the required frontage in a WSP is what? One hundred seventy-five feet. So he just has grandfathered in, right? Ninety-five. Right. Um, just yep. As a general comment, um, just there's a lot of different options and stuff. I know, and you're looking at a lot of options, and I appreciate that. It's a lot of dimensions, and a lot of the dimensions are not, I mean, they're not right, mm -hmm. which is, it probably doesn't change the substance of what you're asking for, but it just makes it harder for us to sort of understand what it is you're asking. Like, there's no way, like, on this drawing, it's very clear, like, the frontage on Ryan Road is, like, about 80 feet. Uh, it's uh, 95 feet. No, it says right here, it's 69 plus 10. It's, it's 70 plus 10, which is 80. It's 95 on Burt's Pit Road. 69 on the front, yes. Yeah, 69 plus 10. Again, I don't think this changes the yeah. content of it. It's just like for us to review it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. The yeah. dimensions like Let's see, let me don't, aren't right. It makes it harder yeah. for us. Um, that's really a not a great... I'm trying to... They don't have another... Bigger? Yeah. yeah. Well, you can see... I see it on my screen here. I mean... Yeah. Because... We've seen this see, yeah, prior I... to tonight, but... I mean, you know, I, when you have a shape like that, it's a rectangle with a chamfered end. Oh, yeah. It can't absolutely. both be 95, right? No, 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 no. Metrically, no. right? Like, no, the, the back, because it goes, yeah. The, right, they're different. It's much narrower. Than... I don't think it changes the overall, like I said, I think it doesn't change the overall conversation we're having, but especially because we're looking at different options, mm -hmm. different setbacks, you know, side setbacks, all this stuff. Yeah. Um, it makes it hard for us to know what it is we are being asked. I mean, it sounds like there's kind of two things here. There's the curb cut. And then, like, it, yes or no on that. And then there's, can you build a house sort of in the location where you're showing it as long as it's complying with the side setbacks? Right. And that's sort of an easier question. Yeah. Uh, Why don't we just focus on the curb cut? Because I think that will move us, move us forward one way or another. I agree. Um, I'm, I mean, I think in terms of consistency, I, I guess I, right now I'm, um, I, I, um, I would say I'd be against against allowing it. I would say, like the one caveat, and I'm right, willing to be convinced, is that it clearly is two different roads. I'm, you know, I, I think it's. I'd almost want to know what like the fire department or the police department think about adding a a. a uh, a, a driveway um, where there isn't where there isn't one because it, it does change it changes the road. So, um, hold, hold on one second. In a little bit, we'll open it up to public comment. Or because you're part of the presentation team, you could come up, but you would come to the podium and introduce yourself. Okay, 
I guess you're part of the presidency. Yeah, she's team. I'm, I'm Denise. I'm in the other half. All right. um, You've the, met. The better half. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for, there is with that 45 feet of the other neighbor, there's, there's a fire hydrant literally right there. I don't know if that makes any difference when you're talking about the fire department, but I think yeah. access pit. Yeah, access to Umber's pit. Is it um, yeah, Umber's pit? Great. Yep. Yeah. I would just also confirm Department of Public Works had no concerns about the safety there. Okay. And there is a driveway in, on Burt's Pit for the next house over on the other side of that hydrant. Right. Yeah. That's what I was trying to understand. So there is, that is a used, oh, yeah. a used road in terms of people. Oh, yeah. 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 Major road. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. And yeah. And, and I would say that we're, we're trying to promote housing on you know second units on lots and uh this is a unique situation because it it has access to two roads um yeah, so it's, it, not, it's not coming it's not some you no that really is right you know i wouldn't want the roads to be connected um to be like a cut right, through a cut through i like i'd almost want there to be something to stop a cut through yeah. from happening yep no 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 i wouldn't i wouldn't wouldn't want that at all because you know i'm not setting up an easy cut through and the garage would prohibit that providing that garage is on that side garage may be on the other side but you know we're going to be living there we're not going to rent the, you know so i would not allow that to happen so you can see the drawing of bird's pit road and there's three houses immediately across from us and then you can see the uh, the driveway uh, the house to the right of me um, and that's where the fire hydrant is and their their driveway comes out right in in that l shape that's a carport, and that's where their driveway comes out, and so forth up the road. Yeah, so that that driveway seems like it's in the character of the neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. How do we have a hundred and seventy five foot frontage requirement in this neighborhood? I mean, it's I know. Look at this neighborhood. Does any lot have one hundred and seventy five feet? So, it, um, <clears throat> this is all in the secondary drinking water supply district. The neighborhood was built before the drinking water supply district was defined. All these existing homes are not considered non-conforming at the moment. You just, if you're going to create a new lot, it has to meet that standard because you need enough space. Um, you also need 80,000 square feet of lot, lot size. That's minimum lot size. And that's to allow enough infiltration ability right. um, to protect the drinking water supply. Yeah. The, the other thing about this also is the accessory building that you allow in Northampton in this area, that would apply. But now the existing dwelling would now kind of be the accessory building. That's why we think we could go with the 1,500 square foot larger dwelling. And that's a little well, we don't have a, to the situation as well. That's gone, right? Right, we allow two family by right. It doesn't matter the size, yeah. There's no primary and accessory anymore. There's just oh, okay. two. That, fine, yeah, okay. But we appreciate smaller so, units. I have dated yeah. myself a bit, you know. Um, yeah. But I, you know, Sam, your question about setting a precedent and all, we, we may see this more. There's a number of lots around the city that their frontage is on one street and they have a big back lot that comes down to another street. So they may want to put a house back there and then ask for a curb cut to come through, you know, to that second house. So without subdividing their, um, their property. So Could this be, um, in terms of precedence, like, let's just say for the sake of it, the you and I, I'm not even sure this is possible in this exact scenario, but let's say you wanted to build like a, a, a five unit place there and then keep, you know, would that, would that, uh, change? Well, it would because it's in the water said protection okay. district. So there's right. no way they can right. do that on. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The open space, we wouldn't be able to comply yeah. to the 60%. Yeah, not that I intend to do that by any stretch. But... Yeah, I mean, it, we appreciate what you're saying about, you know, you don't want people coming through, but, you know, we don't approve this plan for you. We right. plan it for I, whoever I, ever might live yeah, there. And absolutely. you don't know, you know, we don't want to create a, a bad situation. And it would be a uh, future. Uh, no, no. You, and could you see it potentially happening? I, I suppose you could because anything possible. I, I know that for a fact. And, um, you know, uh, could, could we like approve a curb cut, but then required to remove the other curb cut like you can have one curb cut but it's over there now if that worked better for i mean you have a bigger house and a smaller house right so you'd want 
I don't know. I mean, that would kind of back to square one because then, you know, then somebody be, because I don't have the width. That's the other issue. I don't have the width really to have somebody to drive by one house to get to the other house. That, that's the big sort of the issue. If I was, if I was like, how about, I mean, I'm not sure this is allowed, but like a, in a very passive aggressive way, I had a tenant kept on driving on. I, uh, I've had, I had that before. On, on some grass that I didn't want him to drive on. Uh, so I bought a hundred pound boulder and I dropped it there. Yeah. Well, and they no longer can, they have to go around the, the boulder. I didn't want to talk to them. Um, so this was, <laughs> so could we just put a couple boulders there? Solves that issue. <laughs> if, if the tree warden allows us to move the driveway to the original spot, there would be a garage there prohibiting anybody from going oh, okay. through. Okay. And that that is going to be a house man as well. And um, so the curb cut, I mean, there's a few things the curb cut regulations are, are there for, right? There's, I mean, we talk about it a lot in terms of pedestrian safety. I feel like that's kind of a non issue here because Bird's Pit Road is just, you should not be walking on it anyway. Like, no matter what? It's so dangerous. There's no, sidewalk. there's no sidewalk, right? Like, that's not an issue here. But I, I think the other pillar safety. Yeah. The other piece is two curb cuts really. Um, for the in the context of the two family, it's really about on the same frontage. There, are, the, not every lot is a through lot that has two, so you're not anticipating two curb cuts right in a row when you just have one, you know, structure along a street. Right. So this is a different scenario than what the special permit was designed to really sort of address, which is multiple curb cuts right next to each other, serving the same parcel and structures. Um, so I, I think he, this doesn't necessarily set a precedent in that regard, because it really is sort of creating access points that are not conflicting with the same, you know, flow of traffic. Yeah, I'm fundamentally not bothered by this, either the proposal or the or the precedent it could set because to me it's it's two separate streets it isn't two curb cuts on the same street so that's where i'm at with it yeah. I'm, I'm not worried about this coming back to bite us with a different proposal or or being unfair to the previous proposals because yeah, those were all they're very different very different than this to me yeah that's where i'm at yeah. i know he's DPW said there were no concerns about safety, and I get that it is just right around the corner, but my concern thinking about this is that, like, if you have to call a fire truck, presumably the address is still going to be on Ryan Road. They're going to get called to Ryan Road, and what they actually need to go all the way around the other side to get to the right. hydrant, and so it's just going to kind of delay service. No. Yeah, I just can't. literally building another house really? right now that has, like, uh, in, it's East Hampton, but there's 26A and 26B. But it's still going to be on Ryan oh, Road because that's street. where the frontage is. I mean, that's where I think what DPW has the discretion to issue a street number based on, you know, issues relative to okay. access. So I think I would leave that in their camp. Going back to split you right the question because that was one of the questions we had about the house numbers and, and the situation A and B, rear, front, rear, things like that. So it's not our yeah. department, right? DPW, and which that's part of my notes to, to after this. To, um, talk to them as with well. the splitting the lot though like it's just like making it usually isn't it making a existing non-conformance worse or... yeah the splitting is not an option here it can't happen nope and then we don't do that and we have you know no reason to do that it's the minimum lot size and the frontage oh, okay yeah. Yeah. could i move the closed public comment well, we didn't. I don't think we opened it yet, did we? Uh, I would move open public comment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, um, is there anyone at City Council Chambers who would like to speak in favor or in opposition to the application? Okay. Is there anyone um, in Zoom and in our virtual world? Okay. Nobody available there. Um, well, now I have a Hold couple on, more sorry. questions for the applicant. If we close it, I can't. Can't reopen. Uh, yeah, trees we have an answer that we have. So I I appreciate the idea of perhaps moving the uh, the driveway to the other side. I think that will allow you to save at least one of those big oaks there. And I think 
clear cutting that lot would be a disservice to the to the neighborhood and the, and the city. Much as you're going to plant a lot of new trees, that's great, but those will take some time to. Yeah. To, to just answer the question about eventually a throughway, I would have trees in that area. So that would prohibit people from going through yep. that area as well. So that maybe answer, you know, clarifies through a bit as well. Sir, I'm just supporting. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, any other questions for the applicant? Um, so it sounds like there's more work to be done with the tree warden anyway so where the driveway ends up i don't think we're going to know until you know is there there's a whole other public hearing process with the shade tree committee or something that would have to happen um so it's a separate permit process so you would approve what you think is appropriate no if there's any if there are any public shade trees that will um are being requested to be removed, that is a separate process. No matter what decision you make, the applicant will would go there, and um, there's a that's its own separate hearing. If um, there are modifications coming out of that that alter the location substantially, they might have to come back here. But um, typically, that's not the case. It's just. Um, um, you know, the tree warden tries to encourage people to have as little impact as possible on the on the driveway location. So there might be some tweaking, some some additional protection measures, maybe, or some action that would be taken during the construction of the driveway. But um, it, I haven't seen it result in a need to come back to the planning board in other situations. That could change, but they're but definitely. We're only going to approve processes. what's in front of us, right? Or with conditions to alter the location, if that make for saving trees on the property, for example, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm unclear of the exact conditions but to make the. Based upon the tree warden's recommendations, that would be where the driveway would would end up. Would be one of the conditions, I think. Right. No. You cannot, the board cannot um, condition on someone else's decision. Yeah. All right. So I guess that's my question. We're going to approve something with, or theoretically, we could, if we approve something and we're saying the driveway is where this big tree is, then there's going to be another process that says, we don't want you to cut down the big tree, move your driveway to the other side. And then when when or if that happens, then what? It comes back to us again? Yes. Okay. We just now say we want to put the driveway on the opposite side or is it no? Because I don't didn't present it that way. I mean, because we're fine with moving. Yeah. There's no uh, we have yeah, like there's a no drawing problem. in front of us in the application. I could give a revised dr drawing certainly and send it into Carolyn and, and do all that. Uh, and, and move it. Well, so. right. I mean, that's, you're describing like, re, you know, just coming back with a, a revised plan, basically. It's fine too. Because yeah. we just learned this a couple hours ago. Sure. Right. About the, and I, right. I was going to talk to the tree warden to have this discussion, but I, I didn't think it would impact it that. So which, maybe what we should do is, which is the plan actually that you think you are, like, I'm still confused. So, which is the so, plan that you think you're applying? Stand about this? <laughs> yeah. All right. Like, can you just pull it up on the screen? Absolutely. Yeah. One that, if you had a curb cut, the one that you like. Yeah. We're just going to use the uh, right mouse. There. Yeah. Nope. Not that one. Right there. there you go. All right. So. The green arrow. Yeah. Right. So I see a green arrow, but our our Zoom screen is covering what the green arrow says. It, it, that it does that says curb. new curb cut. Okay. Okay. So Bird's Pit Road. We have, um, this is the pin that 15 feet over is the requirement. This is what the driveway would, what we just proposed was the driveway. And then next to that is the house. The driveway goes straight all the way back to the garage. Okay. This would stay exactly the same. So this is the 490 foot square dwelling now. And this is the driveway here. 
So we wouldn't touch any of this. And what we're doing on the back yeah. is here. putting yeah. the uh, driveway in. We're doing the house that we showed, 1,500 square feet. And then we still have the 15-foot buffer zone between the other property. And so we were saying we would put shrubs here to separate visually. So that way um, it would almost look like it's two different pieces of land because it would be separated with shrubbery. And then we talked about putting the different trees. And then if if the information you got a couple hours ago was that there's a big tree where that green arrow is that you can't cut down. Then we would put the, the we would put, we would flip. We'd almost yep. do a mirror yep. flip yep. so that we would put the um, driveway here and the house, which Just mirror the whole thing. So the one that showed the house with the driveway next to the L shape, you, that's not. Oh, that's not our property. No, no, you you have drawings that show a yep. potential scheme where it's like an attached garage. Is that old and not? I thought that was what I, what you might want to do is you have another meeting in two weeks. Um, you could um, continue this, and have the revised plan drawing. showing everything they're describing in that's, front of you and make the determination based on that's the plan. Old. I think that's okay. what you should do. I mean, we're, we're telling them. Got everything. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we that's, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, because it, it, we, the egress, I, I would vote on the special permit for the second curb cut and see what the results of that vote are. A, I think that's a great idea. Could we could we vote on the special on the special permit of the curb cut and then have them come back with a plan without specifying the location exactly of where that curb cut is, just that we're allowing a curb cut off of yeah, yeah, yeah. Road. Yeah. Well, off you of could, road. What you could do is you could um, close the hearing on the special permit, issue a decision on the special permit, but keep the hearing on the site plan open, yeah. and then they come back with the site plan, and then you can close the hearing on the site plan and issue a permit on the site plan based on revisions. Is that Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I, I moved it close. I have a question. I'm sorry that affects the curb cut. So when the if we approve the second curb cut, is the new dwelling going to be oriented toward Ryan Road or toward Burt's Pit Road? Burt's Pit. Okay. Good. Yeah, and I would put a condition on the special permit that these two driveways never are connected and actually have, you know, on the condition that there's something a barrier to vehicles. Yeah. Yep. We agree with Transform that. Transform between the two, yeah. I mean, I think that helps with the yeah. precedent setting issue. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I move to close the special permit for a second curb cut at this location on Ryan Road. To close? To approve it? Or to, to close, close the uh, public uh, hearing okay, comment it. period Sorry. on the special permit only while continuing to leave open public hearing on the site plan second. approval. Second. Motions are made and seconded to close the public hearing on the special permit for a uh, uh, secondary um, entrance and exit off of Birch Pit Road. Um, any discussion? You know, and I'll just say, and this is more of a site plan thing that I'm hoping by moving the driveway, some of the trees can be reclaimed uh, but i'm not sure that can happen if the house is also moved so well, we'll bring that up as site plan um so this gives us time to talk with uh, rich parasoletti who is our tree warden not us but rich will make another uh, they could certainly reach out to rich about the street trees not the on-site not trees. the on-site trees just the street trees right the question for my own uh education if a tree just randomly grows in an area that the city is not all that great about maintaining, but it's in the right of way, that becomes a shade tree just like magically. Okay. But I imagine it has to be some kind of diameter right, though, probably before yeah. anything. Public. <laughs> Public tree that could 50 years from now be a really nice tree. Okay. <laughs> all right. So the motion has been made and seconded to close the public hearing on a special permit application. All those in favor of closing public hearing? All right. Um, is there a motion to be made on a special permit? 
I move to approve a special permit for a second curb cut, um, understanding that it'll be on a different frontage of the property. Am I allowed to say that, Carolyn? Is it a frontage? Yeah, understanding that it'll be on a different frontage from the first curb cut, a different right of way altogether. Um, and with the condition that this new curb cut not connect to the existing curb cut on the other frontage and other right of way. Good. So the minutes will speak to that in case anybody ever comes to us and say, you did this. Well, it or, is a condition yeah. of the special permit. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is there a second? Second. Do I try to repeat that language? Okay. All those in uh, favor of the motion? Unanimous. Okay. Part A has been accomplished. Sure. Now, let's talk a little bit about what we would expect in a couple of weeks when you came back. Okay. Um, once I guess you've spoken with the tree warden about the the, the access points on Birch Pit Road, you might redraw and recalculate the plans there. Um, do we want the applicant to bring us option A and option B, the driveway here or there, or just your preferred plan of site? Okay. Um, is there anything else we want the applicant to bring us? I just want you guys to be cognizant of the open space calculations because you're going to have a longer driveway if you move it to the other side of your property. So there's right. going to be more lot coverage. Yep. So if you were close before, you might go over now. How does it work with the the setbacks? Is this a use a front setback on a rear frontage, or it's it's a if you have two front? You were drawing the thirty feet back parallel to your front, but really you should be drawing it parallel to Burt's Pit Road. I think. I don't know. You also have a rear setback, so it, so up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll do zoning. I live on a corner. I have no okay. same problem. Okay. You have two fronts and two sides, and the side setback more front. <laughs> Any setbacks are related to not only a dwelling or a structure, but also a driveway. Anything that's man-made, no. Not setbacks. So the stripe. Okay, so the driveway could be right up against the abutter's yard. Okay. Carolyn, this might more be a, a question or a note for you for next time, but I was confused about the traffic mitigation waiver notes that were in this part of your um, the staff report. So the applicant has offered to pay the traffic mitigation for this. This is a large unit, mm -hmm. so it's not. I mean, previously you all have considered waivers for. Um, units that did fall in the buy right previously before we created this whole two family. So this is a this is well bigger than an accessory dwelling unit. So um there would be one time payment in lieu of traffic mitigation. Okay. There were some conflicting notes in this section. I think it got copied over from one thing to the other, but that's fine. Okay. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, so any other questions about what you might need to provide us? I'm sure Karen will be available. Carolyn will be available. Question: Did I just hear that the driveway could literally butt up to the property line of the? Yeah, that's water? allowed everywhere. Yep. Awesome. That doesn't count. Okay. The side setback issue. All right. And even the garage, right? Right. Five feet. Four feet. Right. Oh, okay. the garage can be closer to the property line. It is deep. Those 15 feet is for your house. Okay. Right. All right. Yeah, so. Thank you. And you're in good terms with both of your butters? Yes. Well, there, because he can you know, obviously get better access to his backyard now through my new driveway. Right. That is. Yeah. Well, yeah. the other thing. I don't want to hear that. Trees that we're trying to save, our neighbors told us to take them all down. Uh, so. yeah. Well, they have a pool. They wanted more. Well, sound like uh, right with the open space that <laughs> would help us because we could push the garage Everything. closer and down. Yeah. We don't have to worry about trying to get into the. Yep. So that would help all the way around. So that would be clarified. There. Because of the nature of this district, we really want as much open space as possible. Absolutely. Yep. So we really expect that. Okay, doke. So move to continue. Yep. And two weeks is okay for you all? We'll make it. 
<laughs> so it's March 28th, and we do have one other item at seven, but you could put this at seven in front of that one because that one's going to would likely take longer. So I would recommend the seven o'clock, and then you'll just have two items at seven. All right, so we'll need a motion to continue this to March 28th at 7. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor of the continuation? Unanimous. Okay, thanks, folks. Thank, Thank you very much. Sir. Sorry, it wasn't a home run today, but. No, no. It's a, it's a process, and we yeah. want to do it right. Thank you. Okay, we only have two ARs, not three. <laughs> and I don't have the minutes. They're all they were almost ready, but not quite. Okay. Um, let me pull up the ARs. Okay. Um three. Yeah, I feel like this was a totally different case. Well, the precedent is the neighbor who to the <laughs> corner who has a triangular lot with two streets and and a pool. <laughs> Okay, I just want to make sure this is the right plan. Um, date two twenty seven. Okay. So this first ANR is Landy Avenue. Um, you approved an ANR. I uh, maybe a month ago for the same parcel to be divided into two you two lots. No. Oh. Um there's an adjustment to create three lots oh, God. with fifty feet of frontage. I'm sick whenever this comes before us, wherever this project's gonna be. I'm sick that day. This is uh and who is the applicant? Um New Way Homes, John Hansel. So I, I, will, I will say, I, I do think that we need to figure out, I mean, it's an ANR, so we're going to, but uh, I do think that we need to figure out how to best, um, you know, like dividing this up. I, I just feel like there's a, there's a game that's being played, and I'm not sure that in the grand scheme of the city of Northampton, it's a healthy, it's healthy. You know, if you just are, you know, taking little bits of land to build a development, I mean, obviously it's your right. I just think that we need to make sure that what we were imagining when this passed is what is actually ha happening. So, I mean, and I say that because we've had a number of times where other developers have you know they bought something which allows them to, to a sliver to put in a road which then allows them to do a development that the neighbors didn't want you know and it's one thing to stop someone for from uh when you when we build a a piece of property you know like you, you should it's your property and you should have a right to build whatever you want next to it and if there's a home for sale to the right, well, then it was your right to buy that property to stop any development. But, but this seems like we're going, we're allowing. Um, I'm just not sure the spirit is being maintained. Well, and I think that's an unhealthy thing. So, what's in front of you now is an A and R. So you're looking at the division of a parcel, and whether or not it requires a subdivision. Um, there are. Um, many times that applicants come, um, have land, they sit on it for a while, then they change their plan of what they want to do on a property. As long as they're creating lots that are not triggering a subdivision, 
um, because they have the minimum frontage along an existing public street, um, then it just is endorsed by the board as not being a subdivision. So you're not looking at what's being proposed in terms of the development because no, the we zoning. You know that since so just extrapolating what I know exactly is coming what next. Saying. And that's what exactly what I'm saying. You, ex you, you, you hit it exactly on the head. This is a, in my mind, a, there's something that's, dishonest and not neighborly yeah. about this process. I'm not sure about that. Okay, well, I'm it's, glad you're not sure. I'm sure about my opinion. Yeah. And so don't speak for me, please. But um, when this is a process by which something is, the development is not being put up first, this workaround is. And I don't think that um it's neighborly all the time okay great but as i said it's an a and r so that's the law and we'll, we'll pass it i just think that we are hurting the spirit of our town in the process uh, so then i'll editorialize a little bit okay i think that uh there's a large lot that's available um that used to just have one house on it now and the city is trying to advocate for more homes to be built. And this lot will allow um, three units to be built on it with frontage. And that's a reasonable thing to do at this time. I don't, I think perhaps the developer bought the parcel and we have to give him the benefit of the doubt. He wasn't quite sure of exactly the plans and that happens. How many times have we seen applications that we've accepted and nothing was ever built there? because plans went array, all right. So, um, yeah, I also want to be clear that, you know, y you need to be looking at this as a piece of paper and a survey and not the person who's proposing it. And that there are many times, as George said, applicants who come and say, okay, here by zoning, I can have 50 foot frontage lots. I'm going to divide them up. I have no idea what I'm going to do. And 10 years later, the lots are still there. The person didn't do anything and then sells it to somebody else and they reconfigure it or do something more than just single family homes on it. And so that happens across the city. doesn't matter what the neighborhood is. Um, and and the it's state law that sets this up. It's not whether or not this is a spirit of one community or one neighborhood versus another neighborhood. By state statute, the state's a, state is set up that um, you can create lots without having a subdivision approval in this way, and it's completely separate from the conversation about whether or not it meets zoning or what zoning it does meet. And so that become that is a conflict for on the sort of on the administrative side as well because. They don't talk to each other all the time, and you get these weird conflicts where you're not allowed to say anything about zoning on this plan. You can make notes and say, you know what, this doesn't look like it meets our zoning, but you meet the frontage, so go forward, and good luck with that. Um, so I just want to be clear, some of it is the structure of the statutory provisions in the Commonwealth. I, I completely understand, and of course, that's why we're here. I'm going to approve something that gets approval. Um, I just think that, as I've said many times, I think that we need to think about how uh, these kind of developments are happening so that um, the people who live here don't feel used. And that's it. I move to support for this A and R. I do to the beginning session. So people shut up. <laughs> I second. So motion's been made to approve the A and R on Landy Avenue, and and been seconded. Any more discussion? All right. All those in favor of endorsing the A and R. Unanimous. Um. 
Okay, I I'm gonna do. give you a little sidebar here. We have started a new online permitting process. So the next plan set, I have to go online and grab it because it's no, it's in a different location. Um, but let me find it here. They're, they're seeing, so they're seeing probably on steroids, like taking Jenny's Yeah. Which, it's a I mean, which of the neighborhoods that we've approved something controversial has been ruined? No, not, not at all. I, I just think that we're, we're, ne we're never going to get to the point where everyone's happy. Of course not. No one likes, no one likes building. I'm <laughs> on my own. <laughs> <laughs> Except if it's a wait, 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 last one. I didn't build it. Yeah. Wait, which one? Which was the last one? Let's let's hold off on this. There's a couple of people in the shoot. Let's wait until we adjourn the meeting. I think it's a valid thing to talk about yeah, it sometime. Put it on the agenda. Yeah. But let's agree. We're waiting for another A and R, right? Yes. Okay. In fact, um, this one is also one that has been adjusted a couple of times over the last few years. Um, so this is on Marshall and Swan Street. So there were some... I That's a trivia question. Who knows Marshall and Swan Street? This is a joke? Where are they? <laughs> Where is this town? It's not... It's going out Bridge Street towards um, Coolidge Bridge okay. on the left side. So, uh, you know, between um, Day Avenue and Coolidge Bridge. Funny area, that neighborhood. Okay. Oh, yeah. Amherst Woodward and the old, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this lot, in fact, has been sort of modified a couple of times, too. So, but this... Um, lot two is being divided as a um, building lot um, from number 28, mm -hmm. lot one. Mm -hmm. Again, it has frontage on two streets this time. But um, and this is well, this would be an example where um, I, I would give feedback to the applicant because the um, the width of the lot gets narrower depending on the orientation. Right. It's not a perfect square we don't ever have any of those but um so really the only way it would fit zoning is if you were to apply the standards in a certain orientation um so that's the kind of feedback we'd give to people about the zoning i can't prov you know that they can still apply for um an a and r to as long as they have frontage along the street but if they didn't meet the depth requirements they could still apply for frontage, and then we'd probably note on the plan, this may not meet zoning. Um, in this case, it will if you orient it the right way. But th those are the kinds of things where zoning and subdivision rules don't always, you know, talk to each other. You're going to have to take out a shade tree. <laughs> so then I just need um, a... Um, an endorsement that I is not accepted. we endorse the the Anna. Second. Motions are made and seconded. Any more discussion? All right. All those in favor of endorsing the ANR on the corner of Swan Street and Marshall Street. All right. Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Stop that share. Okay. Um the last thing I don't have minutes. Um I want to bring you up to speed on an application that our office has filed with a community preservation committee for funding for design, a redesign of um, the park slash plaza in front of First Churches and Urban Outfitters. That's technically a public park on the First Churches side and going into where that art kiosk is and a circular bench. Um, because of the Picture Main Street project that will um, bring the curb out into the street more. It creates more plaza space there and provides an opportunity to sort of rethink that as a mini public park, pocket park. Um, some of the things that have been discussed are, is there a way to get a little bit of, you know, some kind of 
water feature, cooling feature for that's open to the public, um, like a mini splash park or something, or other ideas there. So, um, um, so we've we have uh, a budget for a park based on what our the design team at Tool has said would cost for to finalize a design. It's it's separate from the road construction, so MassDOT will not pay for that um, under the, the construction of Main Street. Um, and um, so that's why we've applied for funds for design, that, that, which also could put it be put to, towards construction because it is already a park. Um, the, I'm going to CBC next week, and it would be great to have a letter of support from the planning board for this. Um, that sort of we that it falls within the sustainable Northampton um, climate resilience and regeneration plan to look at um, you know revitalizing urban parks and also finding new um, ways to generate um, park flat or park spaces in downtown um, and. So I would just, um, um, we feel like that it improves the existing resources and invites a greater public use and public benefit there, um, meeting special recreational needs of the elderly, the environmental justice populations. If we create space that's usable for multiple um, different types of folks and with different needs um, and adding green space um, so, um, I put that out there for you and I'd be happy to draft the letter for signature from our fair chair, uh -huh. if there's such support. It, 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 I think this is the first time the planning office has come to the planning board for a letter of support. I mean, we've been purchasing conservation areas and doing other things, but, um, I think it's a good idea, but I think this is the first time, right, you've actually asked us to weigh in on something like this. Yeah. Well, we have a, also have a have a seat at the table on CPC, so uh, um, maybe that's the reason um, that it hasn't often happened. That's me. So, uh -huh. Yeah, I don't know if I sign the letter or not if I'm on CPC. Well, if... You can sign it. You just can't. Vote it. It. I mean, I think <laughs> that's what we're all doing. <laughs> the way you could do it, I mean, you could take a vote, and if it's supported, then typically um, letters like that are signed by the chair on behalf of the ah. board after a vote's taken. So, I, I would love to support your letter for new park and rest in in uh, an improvement of an existing park in Northampton, Massachusetts. Support. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And maybe you could do something cool in Sheldon Field while you're at it. Maybe <laughs> metal. Metal. Um, okay, it's going to be a complicated metal. letter. Sliding. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, we'll not put that up. <laughs> so, uh, is there a a motion to support the application to the CPC for said? Uh, revitalization of the urban. That's what we just did. Yeah, you just seconded Sam, that. And then oh, Stacy heard us all kind of mumbling. I didn't. I didn't quite hear a motion. <laughs> so, Chris, Chris made the motion. No, no, no I mean, made Sam made the motion. Chris seconded. Stacy seconded. Second. All right, no. thank you. But I'm voting for it. All those. <laughs> Chris all voted for favor. it. Favor. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Chris is lobbying himself. <laughs> Um, but hey, speaking of CPC, there's a very interesting request from, uh, from the city talking about, and I get really confused about this, but what I thought they were talking about were the affordable housing units that were associated with Emerson Way that then we voted on the board to let them not have them at Emerson Way for reasons that I'm still not clear on, and they moved to Burt's Pit Road. I guess when they got turned over, they wrote in the city as the sole monitoring agent, and the city's never done that before. So there's like certain processes that the monitoring agent has to go through to make sure that it gets advertised, or if you want to put an addition on it, they have to review it. 
So now the city is asking is Habitat for Humanity thing? No, I don't uh, no. It's in that same kind of little neighborhood. So usually if it was Habitat, they would be a monitoring agent and I mean, they're they equipped to do those things. To, right. Yeah. Okay. But for whatever reason, the entity that you know provided these these parcels put the city and only the city as the monitoring agent. So I'm just wondering, as a planning board, where do we do we have any say in that? Is that something we would have seen coming through and we could have flagged? Because I want to know where the where how that fell through the cracks. Because it doesn't sound like it's something that the city's equipped to do without more training and more work that they don't typically do. And I'm just wondering, as a planning board, is there anything we can do? Because it because we've touched this thing as it's gone through the process. So they're probably, it's a tricky situation because um, this is why it's very hard to, to implement what we call inclusionary zoning requirements in the city. Because what happens is you get developers who don't normally do affordable housing, then they're charged with trying to make it financially viable to be able to spread the share of the cost across the affordable units. And then there's this long tail because they have to ensure that it stays affordable and someone has to oversee and make sure that the subsequent owners 30, 50, 75 years down are, um, are that the units stay affordable and that, um, that they're being, um, marketed fairly to um parties that um people. yeah that up um sorry are um qualifying for those units and um the only entities that do that in so valley cdc you know the big nonprofits could do it for a fee um but there's not always a connection between the private developer and a nonprofit and, and an arrangement because the private developer is gone, right? Selling the land and out of it. It's not something that they're going to, they're not leasing the property so that they can manage that. And um, I would have to look at the details. I think, so your, to your point, I think you were asking, would there, could there be a condition where a private developer um, has to figure out the long-term sort of management and oversight of those units. And, and I think, um, um, in this, I suppose it could be a condition, but it's sort of a little bit outside of the jurisdiction. I think it makes sense if there was an inclusionary housing, which in this case, that was the situation. They had to provide those affordable units based on the subdivision approval. Um, but this is the complication you end up with someone that with sort of a void in taking over that and making sure that they remain affordable. So that by default, it was the city. And the housing authority can't do that? The housing authority only has jurisdiction over their units that they own. So what the ask is, is to say, you know what, the city wants to essentially subcontract that. Lee. CDC, because they do this stuff all the time. Um, but there's a cost to it. Obviously, there's a cost for the city to try to do it. So that's where the funding request comes in. Um, the funding request to the CPC. Right. I see. To provide this. And so that's always... So whenever there's not a nonprofit entity that's in it for the long term um, or builds even for sale units, but sort of is still around... There's going to be this problem, and and that is, that's the difficulty. If we were to go down the path of trying to get, you know, that's one of the issues with inclusionary. Housing. So someone's asking for CPC money to pay for Our the office. monitoring. You're you're asking, yeah, yeah, for three years, and then what happens? Is this the one after that three complicated years. swap that Wayne put together. Yeah. That was it always never happened. In my, it was always very. It should have been. If I understood this better, then I would say no. Those six parcels or whatever should, you know, there should be something in the homeowners agreement that they pay for the monitoring agent to monitor 
this thing. Like, I don't understand how it. Well, that's interesting because you mentioned when things come through the board, how we weigh in on something like that. And and really, we don't because often a small um, subdivision is built and we're told that the homeowners association agreement is going to take care of the stormwater management, the plowing and whatnot. We don't get into the nitty gritty of how they're going to do that or the cost of that. You know, we just accept that. There's a homeowners and HOA, and they're going to deal with it. So I don't think that we're in a place. But we to... do have um, certain parts of our zoning that are contingent on providing ex affordable housing. Right. Right? Right. Don't we have those bonuses? Right. But usually the only people that can really apply for those are the ones who know how to do it. And they're and and they're nonprofits because they're getting subsidies and they have to comply with the state and federal requirements for that. But we just put a blanket like provision like that it'll stay affordable and just yeah. knowing that the exactly. applicant sort of knows how to do it. And, you know, if it had stayed in the subdivision, that is one way to do it. The subdivision, the association would have the burden of subcontracting. Yeah. They couldn't do it themselves, but right. they could certainly subcontract. Well, that's what the city is yeah. proposing to do, hire CDC to do it yep. for them. Mm -hmm. The city owns these lots now? No. No, they were just listed as the monitoring agent on the okay. deed writer. Right. And I guess, you know, I don't know who reviews the deed writer. It, it probably should have been flagged at some point. It, they, it was reviewed. I, I would have to go back and check the... Um... I mean, it all comes out in the wash in a sense. Like, Wayne asked for money back when that deal was made. And if the money for the monitoring would have been folded in, like the amount of money that the ask was to make that deal happen would have been a little bit more. So in the end, like it was an oversight, but I don't know that the city's paying any more than it would have if it noticed it six years ago. I was, I, I remember approving that on CPC. I didn't, it was a hard deal to understand. Um, but when well, now it's money in perpetuity, it would have been anyway, though. I mean, we would have paid it up front or something as part of the deal, but like, it comes out the same, I think, in the long run. Well, no, it's not necessarily in perpetuity because what happens is when the first lot sells, I mean, it's going to be for a long time, but when a lot sells, there'll be some of that money that will go into essentially a fund that then supports it after that. It's sort of first getting to those first sales. There isn't any money there until units turn over. And then some of that Oh, so there isn't a need to make sure you're selling it to the right person to start. Yes. But then after that, it's like a mini endowment or something. That it, yeah. scheme. You can, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's expensive to have affordable housing. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, I don't know the answer. I don't, CPC doesn't seem so happy about that one, though. Yeah. Do you want us, the planning board, to write a letter of support? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that'll go. Dad speed bumps in Emerson Way. Yeah. Can we? Can you bring in Wayne as an expert witness and uh, talk about the whole story of how that happened? I don't know. If he's not in China. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And was that it, Carolyn? That's it. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. I move to close me. Second. Motion's made to adjourn at 908. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Great. Can we end the meeting for all?